Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 570, 570 of the Agostino Zynga show. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me clearly? Five bloody 70. And I'm so, so, so happy and thankful that you guys have made it here to see little old me little old me do the damn thing i'm so glad you're here i really am if it's your first time checking out the show as per usual and you like what you hear and you like what you see why not leave me a review on spotify and on apple it takes you two seconds leave a five-star review let people know that you're enjoying the show you love what i talk about um you hate what i talk about you love my face you love the sound of my voice you love the way my hands move around when i speak whatever it is leave me a review i'd be more than grateful for it and i of course shout you out on the next episode of the show so if you leave a review on spotify and apple i'll shout you out whatever nonsense name you put in there whatever troll name you put whatever trigger name you put on there i'll say it live on air it's not live it's recorded but you know what i mean live on air if you leave me a review do that for me i'd be greatly appreciated thank you um what else is going on with me not too much as per usual working out a bunch running a bunch lifting weights as you can see i'm looking very oily just came out of the shower fresh out of the shower using the old palmer's um body oil things i'm using that was it, Is it no body no body oil lotion i'm pretty sure it's called now because you know using the summer to use the palmer's cocoa butter is a little bit of a madness even the light one because i'm usually a bit of a sweaty dude anyway so when i put that palmer's cocoa butter on top of the skin that's already sweaty after the shower and i'm still hot and steamy whoo i start leaking baby leaking 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 baby leaking leaking baby i look like you know those um zorn movies where like the person's getting a massage and it's all oils and shit that's what i look like like, you know what I mean? They're like sliding all over each other in plastic sheets. That's what I basically look like. But anyway, apart from that, everything's been going pretty decently for me. I'm not going to lie. I'm a little bit gutted, to be honest, this week. Because um, this coming weekend, for us in the UK, I'm not sure if it's, if it's the same for you, wherever you are at the moment. But it's basically Easter weekend coking up. So it's like Good Friday, good, what, all that nonsense, right? Happening from this weekend. And the plan was for me, as I mentioned in a previous podcast, was to go to Berlin. That was the plan. I was going to go to Berkheim. I was going to go to the Club Oster something. Yeah, Club o Oster Nacht, I think that's how you pronounced it. I think it's basically called Oster Club Night, which essentially had a really barnstormer, crazy, amazing lineup. I'm actually going to get up on the phone to make myself cry even more. But number one, I didn't book it ahead of time because... I think I've mentioned it previous times. Oh, sorry about that. I think I mentioned it previous times before, but whenever I've been to Berkheim, no, whenever I've been to Berlin, or not even just to go to Berkheim specifically, but when I've been to Berlin, I usually always go like random months whenever I'm just free or there's time off from work. I mean, yeah, I don't usually book it like peak times. I just book it based on maybe a lineup I see or if I've got some free time on a weekend to go. But, Obviously, when you I didn't know that when you book it between the months of flipping, let's say March and July, the prices are crazy to go to in terms of like ticket price. Now, not crazy in terms of like going to America prices, but way more than I usually pay. So, for instance, I'm looking now at a date in like May, and that May date I'm looking at with even with the luggage included is like eighty quid, right? Maybe it might get tops one hundred. Um, without luggage or without like a carry on bag, it's basically like fifty, sixty quid. But this weekend going to Berlin for Easter weekend. Uh, at the time that I was checking a few weeks ago, it was like two sixty five all in to go on a Ryanair flight. That is just not happening. I don't know where you are in the world, but whatever crappy airline you have, paying two hundred fifty five pounds to travel on that plane is just not something I'm willing or um um kind of ready to do at this point in my life. It's just not happening. But I am quite gutted. I'm not going to be able to go to be honest because the lineup does look absolutely mad. I'm going to get up here on my phone. I don't want to make my computer break trying to search for it now. But essentially that, yeah, Oster Club Nutch is, um, so it's this, obviously from this weekend. On Panorama Bar, actually, it was pretty decent. On the 15th of Panorama Bar, you've got Byron Yeats, Josie Rebel, UK stand-up. You've got N Balkhammer and THC. 
Then on the weekend, the 16th, you've got Boris playing, Boris opening at Berghain, then DJ Stingray, Dr. Rubenstein, Fidel, Freddie K, Helena Half, Jazz, LSD, XOXO, Marcel Dietman, Natty Serres, Norman Nodge, um, R. Moximore, so R. Roximore, Steffi, Volvox, then Panorama, you've got I'm opening, Carl Craig, IF, Jennifer Cardini, Kenny Dope, Ketlov, no, Ketiov, Lakuti, Massimo Paligrala, um, OK Williams, Paramida, Peril, Roy Perez, uh, what's his face? Soundstream and Tamo Sumo. Absolutely nutty lineup, isn't it? And I can't go. I'm really am gutted. I'm honestly beyond gutted. Let me actually check what the prices are saying this weekend because last time I checked two weeks ago, it was like 260 something. Let's see what it's saying if I was going to go. I booked time off work as well. So I'm probably going to go and do a, I'm probably gonna do a stage, a staycation and just, you know, find something fun to do here for the time being. But, oh, man, imagine being able to go to... And also, like, that's why I always... That's why I kind of... I was gutted too, because if I'm not... If I'm remembering correctly, before the pandemic, I was planning to go to Berghain. I think on that... Is it... What was it? Is it... I think it might have been, like, the 20... 20... December 2020, or maybe January 20... Or maybe December 2019. One of those meant... I went to go to the Club Sylvester, the kind of, like, New Year's Day thing they have going on, which basically, I think, runs for, like, four days, back-to-back, basically, right? And it ends really, really late. I think Tuesday or something. Nothing like that. It stays open. I really wanted to go to that because I've never been. Because I just want to go... As much as I go there quite often, I also want to go on, like, the really popular days like i don't know there's a may day coming up soon right that might be a good time to go actually i'm not going to be here am i i'm not too sure but anyway there's a may day thing to go to obviously the the easter then of course you've got the, the what you got new year's eve and i think if i'm not mistaken this is the first easter celebration that they've had in what three years or so and the the club the club Sylvester thing coming up on the end of the year is also going to be their first New Year's Eve, New Year's Day party they've had in three years also. So it's going to be an absolute mad one. So I'm probably going to try and get some time off to go for that, actually. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie. So let's say if I went to go on the 15th of April and I went to come back when I went to come back, which was what, the Sunday or something? Let's see what this is, what the prices are. I bet they're fucking crazy. Oof. God damn. To go in the morning is already... Oh, and that's, that's, sorry, I can't go on a Friday because I'll be working that day. So imagine I said I wanted to go, uh, no, actually, I said the Friday's good. Yeah, the Friday, let's leave the Friday. Leave the Friday and then say, so if I went to go Friday, oh my God, that's a mad, fl oh, damn, oh, actually, you know what? Is that return? Yeah, that is a return. That is crazy, mate. So it's already 172 or 173 for, for leaving there. No, continue with value fair. And then coming back, there's no flights on a Sunday. They're all fully booked. So you have to come back on a Monday for £204. Or on a Tuesday, or on a Wednesday, or on a... Oh my God, it's a mess. Yeah, so it's not happening. Anyway, it's not, it's not happening. It is not happening. But yeah, anyway, what can you do? What can you do? So we've got a jam-packed show for you today. Loads of things to get involved on. I don't want to waste too much more of your time. Bear with me one second. Anyway, enough about that. Let's move on to the topics of the day. So first things first, I went to kind of open up on a bit of a weird one. But there's a interview that just got released courtesy of Double XL featuring the one and only Playboy Carti, which for myself being a Playboy Carti stan and a big supporter of his music and just loving everything he puts out and the kind of how he carries himself and the fashion revolution, all that malarkey. It is quite rare because he rarely, if, you know, he basically never speaks to press and he basically never gives interviews and kind of keeps himself to himself. So I think we haven't actually had a press run, actually. Um, for a whole lot of red at all the closest we got to some sort of press run was when he did that um instagram live where he was wearing the the mesh top and i think he debuted um they thought i was gay but whatever that lyric was from that tune so that's the only time we've actually seen him on video promoting the album or talking about the album anyway kind of any shape or any kind of way which might have been a bit of a genius thing to do actually because you know well, i'll talk about the album later but anyway there's a part of the of the interview where it, to me, feels like he's obviously trying to compensate for something that's happened at home, where he really goes at pains to mention or name drop Iggy Azalea, who is obviously his baby mum, many, many times towards the end of the interview. And it just seemed odd, it seemed a bit out of the blue, it didn't seem really 
to kind of have any correlation with what the interviewer was basically talking about. There were some questions in there about, oh, how has the kid changed you as a man and blah, blah, blah. But for the most part, it was mostly an interview centered around him and his artistic expression. So this is basically the bit that Igazele is obviously taking a bit of umbrage towards. The section interview where the interviewer asks Playboy Kai the following. How do you like being a dad? How has that been for you? He says, I'm a father. You know what I'm saying? You know how it is having kids. I got responsibilities. I, I pay a lot of bills. I take care of a lot of people. I take care of my mum. I take care of my family. I take care of my, of my baby mum. And I take care of my son. There's a lot of people I take care of. So it's like, I got to keep going. What are you most excited about what's coming for you? My son. His birthday is coming up in three weeks. I got him a crazy chain, man. He's going to be your problem. Um, that's who you need to. That's who you need to have on the cover. He's beautiful. And Iggy, she's a great mum. I love her to death. I'm single. She's single now. But that's one of the best mothers in the world. And that's what you got to put in the book. That's what you got to put in the book. You hear me? I love her to death. She's the best mother in the world. And it just seems strange because from what we know of Playboy Carti and Iggy's relationship, it's not the best, right? Famously, she revealed that when she was giving birth to their son Onyx, that he was allegedly in the studio with Uzi Vert. And I think that's when that clip or that picture got leaked of Playboy Carti in the studio with Uzi Vert playing PlayStation. So they weren't even recording music. That was even the worst part of it. Fair enough, if you're going to go record music and maybe you can, you know, stretch, you can stretch the point and be like, oh, I'm recording music for us so I can maybe give a better future to my son and look after the family, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, you would imagine as a dude, there are not a lot of things that you basically have to go to or that you're obliged to go to but you would imagine like friends weddings funerals um people you having to go to the hospital the birth of your first child for goodness sake you think you'd have to be there right you'd think so but obviously he didn't he didn't really think that was that important and then of course he they decided to kind of get on social media and basically set the record straight because you know when someone says they look after you which he clearly said in, you know, in a, with his whole chest, he basically said, I take care of that lady, I pay her bills. She was clearly not going to be too fond of someone saying that because the last thing you want as somebody like Nick Azalea, who's kind of, you know, she's a bit of an old, she's older than Playboy Kai, not by that much, but she's a mature girl. She was also around, she also kind of made it or was successful in the music industry for a short period of time before some of these girls were so she had to kind of scrap and really fight for whatever fame she had or whatever notoriety she she got and she's still by you know even though she's not in the limelight she's still able to kind of sustain herself in some way shape or form i'm sure the way she looks definitely helped but you could tell she's a bit of a hustler right she probably left australia on her own with a backpack and she you knows a famous story everyone has went to someone's studio to help out and then that ended up being a creep and then you do this and you do that you know what i mean like she she, she for sure i'm i'm certain if she ever read a book, it'd be incredibly illuminated because I think people kind of have a have her kind of misconstrued because of how terribly she came into the game. She was a little bit of a dummy dumb in terms of how she operated and maybe the way that she was kind of presented or maybe the way that narrative was spun on her. But in general, you get hustler. You don't get the feeling that she's somebody that's just waiting around for somebody to cut her a check. So she obviously went on social media and said the following. Take care of me, LMAO. Let's not get carried away now. Someone replied to her and said, MAO, bitch, I saw that and was like, what? And he says, and she said in reply to that, to that comment, I laughed a lot. And then I think she wanted to clarify her statement because I think some people were saying, hey, you know, he was basically trying to give you props and compliment you. Why are you taking it so negatively? But it obviously wasn't props. She was obviously overcompensating for something happening back home. And she, of course, spilled all the tea and she said the following. You've been misled. No, someone said, he said so many nice things about you. That's what you stuck on. And she says as a reply, quote reply, so everyone could see. You've been misled. I don't fuck with a man I'm not even remotely on good terms with claiming he pays my bills. I pay my bills. Secondly, saying nice things for an interview sounds great. But in real life, he talks to me like shit so badly I had to stop all direct contact. Crazy. So she basically goes for an intermediary, it seems like, so they can look after their kid together. Crazy. His team have been calling me about the interview, hoping for my silence because they know what my reaction would be. I do appreciate being called a great mum, but when that's not reflective of what he has to say about me in real life, I'd much rather be left out of it and not be mentioned at all. And I'm sure after this, I will be. Everyone wins. Yay. And it made me think, what is it about some of the greatest artists that we have in the modern era? Because I think 
we don't really know much about our heroes from yesteryear. I recently watched the Andy Warhol documentary and they tried to spin this narrative about his sexuality and relationships and how that might affect his work. But no one really knew, right? Because back then, you basically got to enjoy people's work. That was it. You might have got insight into their relationships and sex lives and family life if they if they kind of spilled the beans themselves, but it wasn't really a desire or a frothing of the mouth to dig into their personal life. It was mostly, oh, what do they create? Are they funny? Can they dance? Can they sing? Um, are they beautiful? Can they paint? Whatever. That was what you looked at. You didn't look at anything else behind it. So I think to myself, in the modern era, is there a direct correlation between how shitty of a human you are and also how great your art is or how great your artistic expression is? Because I think of two people that come to mind. I think of Kanye West during his whole, from like, let's say from that, that album where it says, um, that album, what's that album called? It's like, sometimes I think I'm bipolar. What's that one called? Is that a yay? Is that what it's called? Is it called yay? Let me see if I can find it here. Sometimes I think I'm bipolar. What album is that one? I don't even have it. I don't have it on my album. I don't, I'm not going to have it on my fucking, um, on my, uh, on my, uh, on my phone because it's terrible. But anyway, you know the album I'm talking about, right? The one where he's basically a picture and you basically writ over it, right? From that period all the way until now, Kanye has been like on like, it seems like a bit of a one man mission to really tell us how he really, no, to basically show us who he really is as a person so that whoever's left being his fans are under no illusions of who, what he stands for and what he's about. That's one thing I credit Kanye for. Say what you want about his personal life and what he gets up to. I don't really try to get involved in that because I don't really give a shit and I just focus on Yacht because Yacht's so good. But, he is quite open and incredibly frank, brute, honest to the point of maybe a fault in terms of how much he puts out of himself. Don't get me wrong, he doesn't say a lot of honest things or he'll probably mislead by leaving things out. But in terms of how he presents himself, he's he very much lays it on the line. This is me. And if you like me, then you like me. If you're not, then you're not. But there's no like, there's no games being played. There's no narratives being spun or whatnot. Whereas I feel like back in the day it was. And I feel like even with Pedro Carter is a good example. He's another person too who, again, we don't get much insight into him, but the things that we do hear about him, we heard about that. Who was, was that young lady? I forgot her name. She was an artist who wanted to put out the tune that she had with Playboy Carter he featured on. He was dragging his feet about getting it approved. He wouldn't approve the record or his verse. Then she missed dropping it on the day she wanted to drop it. She had to drop it later when the hype died. Like Just unnecessary dickhead shit like that. And then, of course, this stuff with Iggy Azalea. But then when it comes to his artistic expression, from the clothes he wears to the videos he puts out to the live performances to the album right whole or red now has basically for me even for me i'd say for somebody that hated the album didn't think it was good especially coming from die lit die lit i played like legitimately all my life i, I must have played that album back to front at least a hundred times and i mean no skipping no skipping i played that album maybe a hundred times no skip but then when Whole Lot of Red came out, I was like, oh my God, this is terrible. Because it was so all over the place. The sequencing didn't really make sense. There were so many different sounds and textures and moods and stuff. It just didn't work for me. Now, don't get me wrong. I wasn't expecting a dialect number two, but it was just a bit of a letdown. But in the end, he kind of proved us all wrong. Because the moment you saw him perform it live, it suddenly clicked. Suddenly, it became a far better album to listen to, which is weird. I think you could maybe equate even Tyler the Creator's Cherry Bomb is maybe similar to that. That was a little bit of a Marmite album. That's just one of his Marmite albums that kind of divides his fan base, similar to maybe G um, Jesus with flipping um, Kanye West. But when you listen back to it, it's so fresh, so new, so quote, quote unquote, it's a, it's a kind of cliche term, but it was kind of like ahead of its time in that kind of, in that kind of remark or that kind of side story. But there is definitely something in it, in being a crap person, also being a great artist. But I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's because you just focus on yourself the narcissistic, the narcissistic side of things, because to be a really high level, high output artist, you kind of have to abandon or not care for your personal relationships, family and all that. You kind of have to be just really single minded on your goal. Um, it all kind of has to revolve around you. You might be the only per important person in the world. Um, I don't know, man. There's definitely, there's definitely something in it. Definitely something in it because this, this is not like a, this is not like a random thing. Playboy Carter isn't the only guy in the world that has issues with their baby mom. But I mean, in terms of like, you know, he obviously knew what he was saying 
would trigger Iggy. He obviously knew what he was saying was also not indicative or reflective of their relationship. They clearly are not in a good place. They haven't been for ages. So why are you saying my name like this? Why are you talking about me as if we're friends? We're not. You know what I mean, we happen to have a kid together. That's it. That kind of energy. But he said it because he wanted to say it and he wanted to, you know, whatever, spin that narrative. But just another example of him being a shitty human. But the album, the music, the singles, even the features, man, like off the grid, Kanye West on Donda, like, come on, brother. Like, just too good. So there is something about being shitty and also being good at art. Something about it. So which, which might explain why really good-natured, kind-hearted, considerate, lovely, you know, light up the room type people don't really do well when it comes to the arts. Maybe in terms of like, imagine like stand-up comedy. Who's the really genuine person that you've seen who's come from a very balanced family life, a mum and a dad, a dog, a fence, an older sister that looked after, you know, a younger sister and an older brother, like the like the kind of classic Americana family who's also gone on to be really funny on stage. How can you, man? Your life is quote unquote perfect. You've got a trust fund. Your dad flipping comes and sees all your shows. Your mum makes makes you dinner every time you come around. I don't know, whatever. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's very difficult to ha to what because you need some darkness to tap into. That's what basically I'm saying. There has to be a darkness. There has to be a a sense of selfish ambition that's burning inside of you and you can't really have that if you've grown up in a family where you were told to like share and to have morals and to be fair and to have manners and you never saw your dad kind of raise his voice at your mom like all those kind of things are they're going to make you a nice person how are you going to be a nice person and then also get on the track and start talking about you know smashing hoes or drinking lean or popping perks or you know stacking money or VVSs, it's not going to happen. So I don't know. Maybe there is something into it. I don't know. Maybe I'm thinking too much about it. I don't know if this is actually a true thing, but I'd love to know your opinion on, on the matter. So please let me know in the comments down below. That would be much, much, much appreciated. Then, of course, the the then of course I wanted to mention the interview itself. Um, so Playboy Carti had a very, very, very rare interview with double XL, kind of out of the blue, really. It didn't really make any sense why this came out now. I'm guessing maybe because he's kind of ramping up for the new album, which he kind of mentions. But the tour has come to an end. Um, he's still kind of, you know, kind of sitting and marinating in the success of Whole Lot of Red. Uh, there's maybe a couple of features out. You know, the Kanye West feature has obviously done pretty well for him. But there's not really been else that's been going on. Maybe, of course, the performances at Donda he did. But it's been kind of quiet on the Playboy Carti front. So it's, it was a bit of a random story to kind of push out there. But again, maybe there is an album or something coming up that we're not really attuned to because Playboy Carti does he intend to kind of just drop out the blue whenever he's kind of ready. Um, let's talk about some of the things that he spoke about that I, I also really like. Da, 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 da. Yeah, so this is probably interesting. Tim talking about Tech Nine. I thought this was really good as well about the juggalo. He says, um, music so is about Tech Nine, of course. Uh people in hip hop uh used to not embrace not to you want to not embrace tech as much as they do now. So you saying that it this is a surprise. And he says the following about Tech Nine, right? I just like how he's consistent. I like his vision. He's stuck to his own vision. People like him are before their time. You know what I'm saying? He's a genius and I'm a genius, so that's how I see it. This might be indicative or a bit of an insight into Carti's direction going forward because I think Whole Lot of Red was actually the reset. I think he was actually done with that sound that kind of made him who he was in terms of that. Because I, I would say Whole Lot of Red was his magnus, magnus opus, right? That was the way to kind of encapsulate that kind of time period, that kind of um, break, the merging of the bridge, right? Was it the connecting of the bridge? The connecting of like the, no, the connecting basically SoundCloud rap and commercial side of things or the swag rap, wherever it may be, right? And he was able to kind of present it in this most truest, purest form. But maybe what we didn't, what we missed was that Whole Lot of Red was never meant to be, because I think when Whole Lot of Red was announced or kind of teased, it came quite soon after Die Lit. So I think naturally people like myself thought, okay, Whole Lot of Red is going to be Die Lit 2, right? An extension of that sound. But actually, when you consider the aesthetic that he's kind of gone into with his, with Whole Lot of Red, the kind of what gay vampire thing he's got going on, when you think about the sound of the album, the influences of the album, the merch of the album, it's all very much away from whatever he was doing on Die Lit. It's all very much punk um, influence. There's a lot of, you'd maybe say, electro stuff in it. It's, it's just, it just goes on a completely different tangent. So if that's the case, 
it would make lead me to believe that he maybe he is going in a tech nine tech nine way of things where he's basically resetting the room. You know how some DJs do the thing where not sure if you're aware, but some DJs will do the thing where they're playing a set, and imagine they're coming after a person who maybe is playing loads of bangers, and they want to play what they want to play. They they don't want to come and just play another banger after after the fact. They might start their set with like what's called a, a like a clearing a room track, a track to kind of reset the room, let people go to the toilet, let people order their drink, let people get settled in and realize okay, cool, it's another person playing. And then they start playing what they want to play, not kind of carry on what that person played before. So maybe this was meant to be it. Whole lot of it was a palate cleanser. Maybe that's the case. It continues, it says, so you're kind of like a 2.0, 3.0 version of that kind of movement. Not the music, but the overall package. He says, I'm more like, I'm more like, sorry, I'm more like, I'm a real life artist. I really studied this shit before I got into it. Tech Nine is the pioneer of this shit. Rock stars. He embraced the rock star punk shit in hip hop and it's fire. So definitely, uh, in, but definitely uh, something to keep in mind in terms of his direction when he's going into music going forward. There's a great picture of, of Playboy Carti then a cover of um, Double XL. Says the following: Do you look at your fan base as a cult following? Do you feed into that? He says it's just a world. I was telling my friends I'm into tattoos right now. It's a bu it's a bunch of people that take tattoos seriously, just like they dedicate themselves to that. You got rock stars, punks. You got emos. You got goths. With me, I'm just like being myself. I feel like I'm. I, it's a lot of people who really want to be themselves and do a lot of different things. That's the reason why it's cult because everybody's not going to understand, and I understand when they see me, especially when I was coming up. They are like, "Oh damn, Carl, it just looks like me, a regular Atlanta nigga." You know what I'm saying? Like, boom, boom, tall dreads tool and dreads and all that and i definitely understand and i definitely get that from him especially the first bit you do get the feeling that he is quite he is quite all in so when he's inspired by something at that particular time he just dip deep start uh, kind of uh, dives deep into it so it wouldn't surprise me if for the run-up of whole lot of red he was listening to a lot of hardcore he was listening to a lot of punk records maybe a lot of metal stuff and that kind of influenced what he was obviously putting out and the aesthetic he was kind of going for and over time it just kind of continued do you know what i mean and i completely understand that and get that for sure um we continue on again here take away back freshman 2017 no, 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 no. i want to actually talk about the bit that i like the most the bit about music actually let's see if i can get that on here bear me one second kind of load come on you mug Oh, come on. There we go. Uh, yeah, a bit about face pain. They call him Michael Jackson. Okay, come on. Yeah, this computer's getting on my nerves, mate. The slowness is mad. Uh, oh, yeah, this is it. I like this bit as well about him being standoffish. It says here, you seem elusive, quiet, standoffish. Are those things that you are by nature? Would you agree with that? You don't do many interviews. You're on the quiet side. Is that intentional or just naturally who you are? He says, sometimes I feel like I don't know how to talk. So I don't want to be, I don't want people to judge me based on how I talk. You know what I'm saying? I was never like that. Even when I got around my white friends and shit, I'm like, what up, shorty? You know what I mean? I don't switch it up. I'm just a product of my environment. I'm from Atlanta. And I love Atlanta. This is me. Certain things you can't change. I get my teeth done. I can get a skincare routine. I can go dress up nice, but I can't take that Atlanta out of me. You know what I think? I think there's a lot of cap. I think what happened to him was what happened to a lot of artists is he was fortunate enough that his talent and his music was so good people didn't care what he had to say so he could get away with not talking to people i think frank ocean realized that quite quickly too because if you don't want to talk to people anyway and your music is so good it allows you not to talk to people you don't need to do it look at kendrick he hasn't we haven't heard him speak in years right and that's basically what it came down to and obviously over time it's become a bit of a marketing thing a brand thing but i don't necessarily think he's he's always been standoffish but there's definitely an element of him that i feel like similar with tyler the creator in terms of being a bit outside the industry right he, he kind of always feels like they get they get counted out you always feel like tyler's always got a bit of a chip on his shoulder where people are like sunning him or even the ongoing beef he has with flipping um with dj khaled where khaled says that no one's listening to that in real life and shit he's like no they are listening to it because my stadiums are full i'm doing arena tours i'm selling out these places da, 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 da. I'm, I'm winning grammys clearly it's resonated with some people maybe not you but some people definitely like this shit Maybe the same thing goes for Clay Carty. He's got to a point now where, like, you know, it's hard now to become the friendly, I'm going to be around everybody guy because you've never been around. 
So just continuing on this thing, it maybe buys into it. And also for me personally, I think his music is far more interesting because he doesn't spend a lot of time with artists. He's not chasing singles. The fact that he hangs around with regular people or, you know, little design kids or scene kids, it makes me believe, especially some of the kids I see him hanging around with on Instagram, they're for sure playing interesting shit on their, on their phones, when they're in their cars, they're just throwing each other links and shit. That's definitely informing his kind of artistic expression. So it's no surprise that he and let's say somebody like a Louis Vert, guys that you would say are actually um outside with the people it's no surprise they make the most interesting music really because they're with the people and they have normal friends and shit and they go and do normal things so they hear stuff they see stuff and it all inspires their work i'm pretty sure that happens as well um i, I don't even doubt it and then um the, the, the bit that i the, 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 oh yeah this is the one yeah about a new album you play some new music one song was called wicked you mentioned that new you had a new album what can you say about it? He says, I was about to name my album Music because that's where I'm at. You know what I'm saying? Music. Which again, I think leading back to Tech 9 leading back to Whole Lot of Bird being a palate cleanser, maybe this is the, again, the next step up the palate cleanser. You palate cleanse, you tell people, okay, cool, I'm never going to make a dial it 2.0. I could do that with my eyes closed. I remember, I think The weekend did it with Kissland. I think when he put the album out, everyone was like, oh, that's shit. It's not good. But he was basically saying, I could do the hits, like the House of Balloon stuff in my sleep. That's easy. But what I'm doing on this pop end, trying to make these like big records that resonate with people all around the world who speak all different types of languages, that's really difficult to do. That's much more difficult to do than what he was doing at House of Balloons. And he, of course, has perfected that to the point now we get Dawn FM, which is, I think, you know, and again, a flipping classic when it comes to like, the weekend catalogue. So maybe this is, that same thing whole lot red was a palette cleanser and then what comes after it will be a far more refined and in tuned laser focused version of what he actually wants to do going forward as an artist i can definitely see that um next on the list here we had uh, no continue music because there's a point um it says yeah walk through the differences between three albums you released they all seem drastically different from each other how do you describe the growth between the projects are you offended by the baby voice he says hmm i don't know i don't judge i don't get mad at my fans for saying baby voice that's how it is that's how it's described he said yeah then there's then then it's that like i said it's music that's what i'm uh, that's what that's what that's what it's for everybody just no that's what it's for so everybody can just i got a lot of people that got to take care of so i'm here forever so the music that I'm making is forever. I've been listening to Mayhem, The Weeknd, a lot of old Atlanta shit, Ratchet shit. Do you think sometimes I need to dumb it down? Do you think I'm too ahead? Maybe because, because sometimes I feel like dumbing it down makes more money. Of course. But him being a bit more avant-garde, I'd say forward thinking, definitely has prepared him to be at a point where he's got this cult fan base. And I think if he just carries on with this, he'll be completely fine. He says, are you making it for the money? He says, no. He continues. Um, when, when does it matter why would it why would you dumb it down he says people talk i just like to have a lot of people i have to take care of i just you see that a lot often isn't it? take care of take care of maybe see it more as a job obligation I don't know, interesting thing you keep saying that it continues here it says and if you do dumb shit down to get the money i'll do that for my family you know what i'm saying i'm just letting people know i know that's going on and this is what i'm on you feel me i'd rather do it now people love it people hate it and then two years from now it's normal being weird is normal now you know what i'm saying um if you're not weird you're not cool so maybe he's saying he's trying to give his fans a heads up like hey i know you like all this shit i'm doing and i'm obviously catering to the fan base i'm giving you weird shit i'm challenging you i'm pushing the envelope and whatnot and you know i'm basically reminding you why i'm your favorite artist every album that i drop which i think has happened to me often but he's also telling them or us fans hey be a be mindful when i decide to sell out and kind of cash a check to feed my family don't judge me it is what it is i've got to feed my family that kind of thing in it like don't be too harsh on me um it continues here Oh, he said he, and the interesting voice they said here about his voice. Supposedly, it says it was a deeper voice on this snippets for his new album. This one is coming out. Uh, he says, what are the topics? Love, sex, rock, rock, rock and roll. Uh, I love the bit what he says here at the end. Towards this, He says, the question is, what are the topics that are important for this project? What did you notice while making recent music that you would find yourself rapping about and writing about? He says, love, sex, drugs, changes in my life. I've been rapping about going to rehab, which is interesting. Because I think a lot of fans have been basically saying that he needs to kind of lay off the lean, the perks and whatnot, but it is what it is. Rockstar life. 
He says, I want to go to rehab because I want to, I think I'm bipolar, so not even the drugs. I want everybody to feel free. I want this album to make everyone feel free. I hope this album brings peace to the world, honestly. I'm in love with what I'm doing. Like I told you, you can't put a genre alternative on me. My little brother told me that all the time. So I love the fact that he's kind of pushing away from the genre. And I think that's always like a journalist thing. I don't think fans give a shit. When you're listening to an artist, fair enough, you know, you listen to Playboy Carti at the beginning because he happened to be a hip hop artist or he's hip hop adjacent. But once you start becoming a fan of him, whatever he puts out, doesn't matter where the sound goes, you're going to still listen to it. Unless it's maybe, I don't know, like a West Side Gun or that, those typical rapper rapper kind of guys. Maybe if they decide to make a disco track, it might throw you off. But if you're a fan of them, you should be willing to give them a chance to try anything. And as long as it's presented in their in their kind of way, you would you should like it, innit? That's what you think about it. Um, he says that I'm a hip hop artist. The people who tell me I don't go by the rules. Uh, what else about not this one? Let's continue on. Of course, Kanye. Oh yeah, cool. Of course, the Kanye thing is true as well. Um, it says Kanye is his brother. What can't describe how much his family to him. And then, oh yeah, this is the one. Let's go to this one. I think, uh, where is it? Is it dated? Let's see. I think that was when everyone was flipping, throwing their arms out in the air about. Uh, where is it? I think it's there. Isn't it? Where, where is this here? Yeah, this is the one. This question here. So there's a question here on the on the interview. It says the following. Um, yeah, so how do you respond to the face paint? Um, his family, I'm assuming. It says, they laugh, but they know. My friends call me Michael Jackson. They're like, you're on your Michael Jackson shit. Cool. But then the interesting question says the following here. It says, did you have to grow into a place to be comfortable with that side of you? The face pain and that kind of expression. He says, I wouldn't give a fuck because it's like, I love everybody. I don't judge nobody. I have gay friends. I have trans friends. You know what I'm saying? I done dated. Dot, 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 dot. So do you think this was a revelation that he put in there that he might have dated guys before, trans people before, people that were identify as trans, whatever it may be called? Maybe. But I also think, does it bloody matter? Really, does it matter? Because I think if you're a fan of Playboy Carti, you would have clearly seen a difference in his aesthetic, a difference in the way he kind of carries himself, the things that he's talking about in his music. And it could lead you to the possibility of thinking he might be into dudes, right? Or it could be thinking he might be bisexual. But it doesn't necessarily matter to me when it comes to the art. I've never really cared about it. And I think going back to the Andy Warhol thing, that was a reminder for me because as good as that documentary is on Netflix now at the moment, it's got some weird thing, technology they use where they basically were able to kind of um, get Andy Warhol's voice in an AI machine and have it read aloud his um, diaries, the diaries of, I think it's the diaries, yeah, of um, Andy Warhol, which I've got the book of. It's a kind of diary entries that someone published in the book. And um, they basically, it reads it in his kind of voice, which is flipping weirdly spooky. You can kind of notice it's kind of robotic at the beginning, but once you start watching the episodes, I think there's three or four of them, you start to get used to it. But in that documentary, they put a real big onus on trying to uncover or unravel um, Andy Warhol's sexuality and how he wanted to present himself and that stuff. And I just don't think it's necessary. I think it's really, really abhorrent, really, if, if I'm being completely honest, because it kind of takes away from what that person was put on this earth to do. Um, make art. Yes, the sexuality and relationships may influence the art, but the art is what matters. The art, the art, the art. Even the family life isn't really that important. It might inform you. It might be an aha moment when you figure, oh yeah, he came from an abusive family. That's why his paintings are like this. Cool. But for the most part, it's about the art because Andy Warhol is a good example. Playboy Kai may be a good example. They already live enough of a action-packed, fruitful, drama-filled life themselves right just being a person uh, existing as an artist you don't even need to dig into a relationship it's already enough to talk about do you know what i mean it doesn't necessarily matter so i look at this and i'm like and if anything as well part of me also thinks it's very weird that you have it feels like there's a real big it feels like media have a desire to i won't say out but to be there when somebody wants to maybe come out of the closet or to maybe ask the artist or the creative whatever it may be to clarify their sexuality or their relationship status or what they think about family or marriage there's a real big kind of fervent a fervent fervent whatever like frothing of the mouth to kind of uncover that like let me be the first to say oh wow look this person's this you admit it on our paper 
But if we're being honest and we're living in a forward thinking society where LGBTQ plus people are able to kind of live free and do as they please in terms of moving around in the, in the world and getting married and having unions and raising families, we've kind of really progressed a lot in the last, it feels like 10 to 20 years. If that's the case, and we now get to a point where people are identifying as different sexes or genders and they're not even doing it the conventional way in terms of, oh, I'm trans. It's like, no, I'm trans. I'm, I, I feel like I'm some days I'm male presenting, I'm female presenting, I'm no, but whatever it may be. And everyone's kind of, even though it's confusing, people are willing and able to have time and patience to kind of understand their point of view. If that's the case, really and truly, the real form, I think, of expressing it and of living your truth, no, so expressing it is basically living your truth living in the world and just dating who you want to date because you're attracted to them without putting a label on it is actually where we want to get to we want to get to a point where no one gives a crap that you're gay no one gives a crap that you're queer that you're lesbian that you're whatever it's just whoever you love you love and people celebrate that that is it so the fact that he doesn't even want to put a label on it or it doesn't even even thinks about is a step in the right direction i feel like the younger generation come up a lot a lot like that they don't necessarily maybe they put the labels i feel like to maybe describe themselves to the boomers so that they can kind of maybe put a bit of distance or maybe give them a heads up and be like hey by the way this is who i am or maybe just to kind of annoy them i don't know what it is but for, for the most part i don't think the younger generation actually are like you know banging on about their pronouns to their group of friends because their group of friends know they're not banging on a, or, you know for them to uh, uh, no one in a group of friends looks at them weirdly if they happen to kiss a boy and a girl in the same night at like a at like a club or something no one cares you know what i mean it, it feels like only the media the kind of old establishment mainstream media are still kind of hell bent on uncovering and revealing someone's sexuality it's like who gives a crap man like leave the person alone but anyway what do i know in it what do i know but yeah that's the topic i wanted to end on there um so uh, please check out the interview it's really really informative really really interesting I feel like Playboy Carter is one of the more interesting artists that we have especially now with this newer generation and he's definitely kind of offers up some interesting proposals when it comes to hip-hop music and how he basically sounds and the way he makes his voice into an instrument and the hooks and the whatever everything's really cool to dig into with him he's very Marmite-ish in the same in the same way all great artists are either you get it or you don't and if you don't i totally get it but i definitely do think he's one of the best artists to come out of that kind of crop of like youngsters from his kind of, of generation and it's good to hear him say he's making music he's on the way to making a new album too i'm definitely definitely looking forward to that i'm not gonna lie i am not going to lie uh let me pause this for now Anyway, let's move on. Let's move on. So, uh, what's we'll talk about? Oh yeah, let's talk about this. So, in it feels like every other week there's a new sort of footwear brand coming out at the moment, and for whatever reason, they don't seem to be the most interesting or forward-thinking brands in the world. What they do is that they already they take like already classic silhouettes and basically make their twin or in this case, they twist on them. And in my opinion, I think it's really boring. It's really, um, it's kind of obvious. It's lacking inspiration, innovation, creativity. And it just, for in my opinion, just continues on the kind of tradition now at the moment where everything is really mundane. Everything is really kind of middle of the road. Everything looks the same as it does, the same as what everyone else is doing out there. And no one's really pushing the envelope or asking interesting questions or posing interesting questions apart from maybe Yeezy, right? And what they're doing in terms of footwear. Everything else just looks exactly what the classics that you're already used to. And another example of them are these atrocities. They're called Mis Mischief, actually, and Tiger have collaborated on these. Um, essentially, what they are is like the classic Vans old school. And they've added uh, some waves onto the midsole and onto the little motif on the side to kind of make them look a little bit different than what they basically are, which is basically a pair of Vans. And in my opinion, I just, I'm bored of this. I am legitimately bored of this. I'm bored of people taking classic silhouettes like an Air Jordan, like a Dunk, like an Air Force One and putting their twists in it. At the moment, you've got John Geiger on Twitter every single day crying at the fact that Nike won't allow him to copy an Air Force One model and put his little 
silly logo on the side of it and plus all these little paisley patterns on it and it's like dude you're clearly creative you clearly have a little bit of an innovative mind why not take all that creativity and design an entirely new shoe from the ground up now john guy would argue and say hey guy that shoe is entirely new from the ground up that's why i'm fighting nike in the court of law because i feel like i have the right and the ability to take inspiration from what they do they don't own a silhouette i can change it and edit it to my liking and i've edited it to my liking but let's be clear and let's be honest to so the lame man walking on the street they would have no idea who a john geiger is or what a john geiger is or if they saw that shape and that silhouette more likely than not they'd think it's an air force one so you're just kind of um, building your success off the base of something that you already know works that to me isn't really what you should be in it for what's the point of making your own shoes if you're just going to make different if you're just going to make the same shoes as everybody else if you're going to make your own shoes and have them manufactured and have them made why not start from scratch and actually redefine what an outdoor shoe looks like redefine what a running shoe looks like redefine what a casual shoe a skateboarding shoe whatever shoe it is take an idea or maybe use the ideas that you have in your clothing and apply it to some trainers and make it interesting i've always said for the longest time part of the reason why i like design the shoes for the most part especially designer shoes nowadays the modern era you look at what matthew williams is doing at Givenchy with some of the designers he's got us there you look at what demner's obviously doing at balenciaga you look at maybe what kiko is doing with asics for the most part designers when they approach sneakers they usually come at it from an interesting point of view like imagine if you used to go to like st martin's and you decided to have a brief as nike or adidas to say hey redesign or reinterpret what an Adidas superstar is. More likely than not, those kids and those people on that course, wherever course you choose, whether it's footwear design or fashion or textiles or communication, they'll go absolutely crazy on that silhouette and present something to you that you've never seen before, something completely out of the blue. They might take the ethos of the shoe, the inspiration of the shoe, the tone of it, and apply it to all different shapes and sizes, right? All different silhouettes and sizes. But for whatever reason, streetwear guys seem hell bent on just copying the classics and just trying to build off it and then cash out on fans because for the most part if you can't get a hold of a decent limited edition vans old school from like a double taps from a neighborhood from a brain dead from a whatever other brand out there collaborates with vans this is might be the next best thing right this is like the this is like the the newer version of the revenge storms right that's basically what these are right they're basically building on top of a already classic shoe and then doing them in colorways or in models or in shapes or with applications that vans haven't done yet and then basically exploit in that way and then cash grabbing it in that direction and i fucking hate it and most likely or not let's think about price wise these shoes are going to be like what a hundred dollars maybe more right maybe 120 maybe 150 and in my opinion they are complete dog shit don't get me wrong if vans put these out officially my interpretation of them might be a little bit different but vans didn't put them out some kid at this brand called mischief decided to collaborate with tiger who in my opinion is again one of the most if not one of the most uncoolest people in the industry now he might be up there with rich the kid in terms of his un his levels of uncoolness for me personally speaking you look at that pyramid brand shit that he did back in the day absolute trash the clothes that he wears now trash the best thing about tiger at the moment is the fact that he kind of keeps his head down and he's got a great set you know he's got a great head of hair at the moment he was going bald one moment and the next minute he pops up he's looking like snoop dogg that's fucking amazing but in terms of fashion and clothes like kanye said about lady gaga do you know what i mean he put some good so he make he makes some good songs tiger he knows how to get the club jumping what the fuck do you know about sneakers like, what the fuck do you know about sneakers? And the fact that he's collaborating with his brand tells you everything you need to know. Like, come on, man. I just I just don't get it. Extremely wavy with a sticker on the back. It's like, come on, man. Get a new and fresh idea. And maybe because Vans don't care. Or maybe this is a quick cash grab before they send the cease and desist. I don't really know. And someone could say, oh, no, these aren't, aren't these just the same as those Mishiyamoto's and what, what's that brand called? Mishi, uh, Mishiyaramoto or something like that. I forgot that brand. No, they're not. Because if you've actually seen those Mishi, whatever shoes they are in real life, they're a lot wider in terms of the base and what they look like, their vans. You can tell straight away that those um, shoes I'm mentioning, the Japanese shoes, that they're kind of based on vans and Converse's, but they're sold at a really crazy high, high price point, And they have a little kind of molten, melted sort of look to them. You can tell that those aren't vans. As soon as you look up close to them, there's no there's, there's no kind of confusing. Whereas a John Geiger, they basically look like Air Force Ones, and these mischief Tiger shoes just look like a van shoe. Even the, the the wave on the side of it, they haven't really changed it. It's the same shape, same size, like everything is exactly the same. I don't really I mean it's like if anything, you know what these shoes are, which might explain why they're Tiger collaborations. These look like the perfect shoe for somebody that's from LA 
like that kind of LA scene stuff person. I could see them wearing those kind of shoes. The ones that go to like, you know, industry events or they might go to a few warehouse parties here and there or they might work at a store or like a dispensary. This is what they'd wear. This sort of shit. Like it's fucking garbage. I honestly don't get it. I really don't. Maybe I'm in a minority here, but I don't understand why as a designer. And again, somebody who's done a little bit of design work myself, somebody who I would say in my other artistic expression when it comes to DJing, I try not to repeat the same set in terms of how what I play, um, in terms of outfits and stuff that I like to wear. If I see someone prominent wearing something that I have, I'll put on eyes for a while because I don't want anyone to say, oh, you got the Pharrell hat or you got the Rocky jacket or you got the this, that or the Bari that. No, I don't want that. So sometimes I'll purposely not wear something for months and months so that I don't have to have that clash. Maybe because I, you know, I was brought up in a different generation. I'm not really too sure. But why? Why, why, why? And then of course, Who's going to be debuting them on their feet? Who's going to be the one to put them out there and to show everyone that they're the thing? Of course, ASAP Bari likes them. These shits are fire. Fucking J Balvin. J Balvin, the man who can't say no to anything. He makes great music, but in terms of style, he's just like, like his tattoos and shit. He's just like a smorgasbord of shit. Like there's nothing that this guy can say no to. You could bring this guy pink. What? No, you could bring this guy anything. Forget pink. You could bring this guy anything terms of clothing that fits him and he'll wear it there's nothing that he does not like and everything looks terrible on him personally i think that you just have like as opposed to someone like bad bunny bad bunny has impeccable style and you maybe some people would say they're in the same universe but i don't think they're in the same universe at all i think j balvin just in terms of like his overall outfits and stuff and his dress sense and his style is terrible but on the other side of things too I've always said for the longest time, I have sympathy for really rich people, especially really rich youngsters, because it's really hard to dress really well when you have all the money in the world to buy anything that you want. And you're also getting sent stuff for free. It's very difficult to put outfits together. Very difficult. We've seen it often because a lot of people don't dress well. They have money. Whereas when you don't have much money and you're able to scrimp and scram and maybe you have one designer piece and the rest of the stuff that you've got on you is either secondhand, thrifted, vintage store, eBay, old, whatever. You end up looking much better than someone else wears head to toe designer. And that's just the case, isn't it? Because just, you're just spoiled with the options. But those way, like, look how dumb they look, bruv. They just look so shit. Why don't you just wear a normal pair of vans? I don't get it. I really, really don't get it. Their purpose, in my opinion, I think they're absolutely terrible. And of course, the pages that would, would kind of, of course, um, who, who is Celebrity Advice are taking the piss out of the people that are covering it in terms of um, my friends over at Hidden.NY, <laughs> the page that blocks me. Imagine blocking an individual like me. Me. Who am I? I'm a nobody. But because I have some critical things to say about your page and the way you present yourself and the shitty products you put out there, I get blocked. I don't give a shit. I don't check your fucking page anyway. But just the other day when I was talking about them, um, I went to go and check their page. I was like, oh shit, I can't see it. It was it sorry, this page cannot load for you. I was like, hilarious. Hilarious that you'd block somebody over comments they talk about in terms of your clothes that you make. But hey, who cares? But regardless, I hate them. I always said in the comment there below, you know, sometimes Jay Bobby needs to say no. But yeah, I absolutely hate them. I really, really do hate them. I think they're absolutely garbage but i'm sure they're gonna they're gonna fucking fly off the shelves because they're new and interesting and you know it's a different shape than what everyone's wearing at the moment and i don't know i, I don't get it personally it's not for me i don't like him i think they're terrible i'd love to know what you guys think though in the comments down below would you wear a pair of these mischief and tiger imagine fair enough if they were miss mischief shoes fair mischief vans model update wavy whatever cool but tiger shoes, you want me to wear tiger shoes? Come on, bruv, man, come on. I rate myself way more higher than that to wear tiger shoes. It's just not happening. Wavy baby on the ins... Man, fuck out of here, man. Wavy baby on the tissue paper. Are you absolutely taking the piss out of my life? Come on, man, piss off, piss off. Anyway, if you like them, let me know in the comments down below and I'll, and I'll delete your comment. <laughs> I swear to God, one absolute shit show, mate. One absolute shit show. But anyway, we have to continue if you're listening or you're watching this you should hopefully not notice any difference but i've had to re-record this segment like six or seven times so anyway here we go again for posterity's for posterity's sake we go again we slam again we get into it we don't complain we keep on hustling because hustling is all we know how to do so next in the news we have some interesting developments considering my favorite, the most popular and most beloved Instagram page in the world, Hidden.ny. 
they've decided to collaborate with Needles. A collaboration of two of the greatest forces within menswear and streetwear have come together to present yet another reconstructed collection. <laughs> Woohoo! Just what we needed. Right, we were all devoid of inspiration, not knowing what to wear, not knowing what to buy, how to drop it, how to swag it, how to flex it, and then bang, here comes Hidden NY and Needles with a reconstructed collection like it's 2016, yay, motherfucking yay. Obviously not, obviously not my favourite, obviously this collection is absolutely tired with a capital t or as the sassy ladies and the gays say on social tired right or whatever that word how they put it together i know i probably fucked it up there but again i'm not the coolest person in the world so please forgive me but regardless this hidden and needles collaboration is tired it's bored it's lacking um it's lacking innovation, freshness, whatever it may be called. And I actually feel sad for Needles because if anything, this is a living representation and manifestation that your brand is dead. Do you remember back in the day when if you collaborated with the hundreds, it meant that your brand was shit? This is a good, this is a good example of it. At least with the hundreds, Bobby and Ben and them, man, they've survived nuclear storms. They're like, what, 10 plus years, maybe approaching 20 years in the game, maybe even more than 20 years in the game, still putting out stuff that people want to wear, still putting out stuff that connects with a certain demographic of people and still selling out of collections and products, still doing the damn thing. Bobby still follows all over the place, writes books, all that good stuff. They smashed it. They're certified. But when Needles, a very well-established, well-liked brand such as Needles, a brand that has far more in its collection than just the track jacket and the track pants, but unfortunately, a couple of kids decided to wear the track pants and the track jacket and then the reconstructed flannels, and that was it for the rest of the collection. It didn't exist after the fact. Because of that, they've been pigeonholed into being this reconstructed brand when they have far more to them than reconstructed. But of course, because of that, no one cares about anything else they put out. They need to restart their brand, get it back into the cultural zeitgeist, find that spark, find that life again, find the, the, the whatever connection they have with their customers. And they think that this is the best way to go forward because, of course, Hidden NY, I think, has a lot of followers. I wouldn't know because I'm blocked. I had no idea how many followers they have. I'm sure it's a lot. They probably have way over 100,000, maybe two, maybe three, maybe four, maybe five. Who knows? But I get it. In Needle's head, they probably think, you know what? They've got the youth market in their hands. They're regurgitating pictures they found online with no context, with no explanation. They've not, you know, they're just rehashing the same picture you see all over the place on your timeline and presenting it as some sort of, um, you know, um, some sort of a representation of their taste level when really and truly they know absolutely jack shit about images that they're putting out there. But they've got the kids in their hands. So if we collaborate with him or with that page, then hopefully we'll get our band back up to the, you know, where it needs to be. But imagine, right? Because maybe because Hidden NY is a faceless thing. You don't know who's behind it. Is it one person? Is it two people? You don't know. You, you just have a feeling the guy is going to be a cornball. Let's say we don't know who the person is. Fair. That's okay. We don't know who the person is. But this is just as bad if, imagine if Capital collaborated with Little Jupiter. If you saw a collaboration with, instead of that smiley face, it was Little Jupiter's face doing that weird like face that he does when he poses with sneakers. Imagine how lame that would be. It's the same thing. It's just lame. It's absolutely lame. And it's like, what six or seven years too late in my opinion but again i feel sad for needles because i do remember there was a point in time where i'm pretty sure somebody in the industry told me or maybe i saw it online that needles for a, a particular amount of seasons weren't allowing stores to purchase just the trank pants on their own they were requesting that they purchase the whole entire thing or maybe it was how they sold it online i forgot what it was but it was a period in time where the the track pants were selling so well that they were basically being left with a surplus of jackets that weren't selling at all because people just bought the track pants. Because if you're familiar with Needles, if you go on the actual site, uh, needles.jp, I forgot how, what the site store of URL is, but you'll find it on Google, you can search for it. The actual track suit is always made in consideration with a jacket. It's never just made as a pant alone, but they sell the pants separately. And because the pants became popular, people just bought the pants and they had a surplus of jackets just sitting there waiting to go into the scrap heap somewhere. Do you know what I mean? So for a period of time, they were like, no, we have to enforce this buy the full thing collection. And it didn't work because everyone stopped buying them after a while. Then they allowed people to buy them individually. And now they're now here they are collaborating with Instagram pages in effort to get their kind of mojo back. And I feel sad for them, to be honest. I feel really, really sad because the items themselves on their own aren't that bad, right? But the logo, the name, walking around with that circle and that, with a H on the inside, it's just lame. Who would want that? That's as bad, again, maybe because kids are different and it's all minimalism and all this shit, but this is no better than the Adam Bomb for me. 
that Adam Bomb for me was a representation of when Hundreds died, and I was the biggest Hundreds fanboy. I loved Bobby Hundreds. I used to read his blog every day. I'd be flipping um one of his reply guys on social media. I flipping sucked that guy off good and proper back in the day when I was a kid. Right. I loved their his relationship with Ben Hundreds. I love the fact that they built that thing from the ground up and they, you know, basically gave loads of people from that from that store, that kind of universe careers. They've gone on to do their own things. Many people who are kind of remembered now who have gone on to carve their own careers in streetwear off the back of that. We got introduced to maybe maybe all of us maybe found brands like Diamond and Co. Supply all through flipping um um hundreds. But the moment that Adam Bomb came came around that was when they kind of crossed into the zoomies th things they became a real commercial brand and ever since then i didn't really care for the brand too much and i think that h is the same thing that circle h thing is such a corny cringy logo i would never be see dead dead wearing it absolutely dead wearing it dead 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 it looks so terrible absolutely hate it um but the, again the shirts themselves don't look too shabby but again they're too little too late if anything they look quite similar to what kiko did a while ago um again that was a long time ago have you ever seen him do anything reconstructed again no because it's not fresh the logo is even a bit shit i feel like what they do is just you know it's a little bit instagram graphic designer do you know what i mean it's just nothing if it stands out I wonder if the, all these logos are the ones that they crowdsource because they love doing those competitions, isn't it? Design our logo for us because we don't know what we're doing. Tell us what direction you should go. Our it's like, come on, man. You're crowdsourcing your flipping designs. You jack all your pictures from the internet with no context and no information, nothing to educate or inspire the kids. You rehash the same images that everyone else has used. You're not championing anyone. It's not like they even got like a text alert. For instance, who, who is Celebrity Vice? You may not agree with all his opinions. I definitely don't. But you know where he stands on certain things. He doesn't fuck with Drake, right? <laughs> he fucks with all those other guys that are in the Virgil Abloh universe, um, RIP. Like he has a, a distinct taste level, right? Of who people that he likes and doesn't like. But this is just like standard things. It's just like whatever it may be. And I'm sure for the guy himself or for the people that do it, they're probably over the moon, but it's just trash. It really is. Like as a garment itself, it's not too shabby. Don't get me wrong. The hoodie and stuff, like cool. But to be seen wearing a any jumper, any clothing like this outside of merch that's got hidden on it is just, nah, I can't do that. It's just not happening. It really isn't. I don't know what kid is going to legitimately spend needles money to buy hidden and white merch. That's what you're doing, basically. You're spending needles money to buy hidden and white merch. Imagine that. Like, come on, man. Like, what, what, what guy is going to go out? Again, I know there's some cool, sharp dudes out there, right, that are wearing, you know, light denim with white socks and their penny loafers with their vest underneath and Vivian Westwood pearls and fingernails painted and shit. Right, the cool kids, right? Like, they're doing their thing. They're on it. They're on TikTok posting their outfits and stuff. But imagine wearing this with that on the bottom of it. Why don't you just buy the actual needles jacket? Why don't you buy even secondhand? You could probably pick one up for a pretty decent price. Why would you want that H on your chest? Like, really? It's like the sign of an anti, it's like the anti call sign you put that on your chest for me personally. Um, the t shirts are probably the best thing in a the collection, right? These, the navy, I think there's a gray as well, right? Yeah, there's a gray too. But the interesting thing about it, the t shirts are the best. Why? Because that logo, this sort of hidden logo here in the front, um, on the front chest, like design placement, right? This kind of looks similar to me to like Aphex. Is it Aphex? Aphex, how you pronounce that brand? It's a similar sort of placement, similar sort of um, design. No, don't, don't, is it all my, all my bugging? It looks very, very similar. So that's probably why it looks so cool. Um, so, they, see what I mean? They can't even, they're doing a collaboration with a, you know, a very well known, well respected Japanese brand. They get a chance to do whatever they want, come with it with fresh ideas, and then they go and just jack the Afix logo and try and just write hidden there instead. It's just like, it tells you everything you need to know about that brand, isn't it? Like, come on, man. Now, I'm thinking, right? What's more lame? Wearing a pair of hidden socks, right? The socks with the H with a circle, that logo, or wearing the, you know, the old school um, Huff um, weed socks. Because you could wear the weed socks now as a sort of weird little nod um, tribute to Keith Huffenegel, the founder of Huff, who unfortunately passed away, I think to like brain cancer or something tragic like that, right? You could wear that as a tribute to, to him and what, he, and what he kind of built with Huff. You know, the weed socks unironically. But they're still lame, right? Those weed socks, they're still fucking lame. I had a pair. I know. I had a pair. Camden, you know what I mean? I, f I think I even bought them from Camden Market. It probably wasn't even legit. I had a pair. Trust me. Absolutely terrible. But imagine wearing, what would you, what would you, what would you like, what's the, what's worse? What's definitely worse? 
the hate socks or the weed socks? Let me know in the comments down below what's worse because I can't I can't tell. I think they're both as terrible. There's probably a kid out there who's going to wear both of them. Who's going to wear one, one, one foot with weed socks, one foot with hate socks and think, <laughs> and think he's stunting. And I'm going to be like, no, mate, you're not stunting. You look like an absolute weapon. Like, nah, I'm not, I'm not for it at all. I think they look trash. Not for me. And if anything, like I said, it's just, it's sad for needles because this definitely does represent that they've kind of, kind of died essentially, right? Through no fault of their own. They make good clothes. Um, I think their lookbooks are pretty interesting and cool. Um, it's just, they happen to stumble upon a hit in terms of the track pants. People love them so much to the point where that's the only thing they wore. Then they then they progressed into the flipping reconstructed flannels. They were a big hit. And after that, it was a wrap. Because that was a thing back in the day, right? Wearing the reconstructed flannels, a pair of skinny Subies and some Jordans. That was a look. And then, of course, that look is completely died now for the most part. But still, kids still like that sort of shit. And now you've got them available on you know aliexpress and shit from fake places like it's completely gone that that trend it's absolutely died in the water i'm pretty sure you probably be able to find a reconstructed top on sheen on something like that if you looked hard enough i'm pretty sure you can find one on there too maybe someone's selling one on etsy like it's just absolutely dead in the water and i feel sad i feel really bad for them because the last thing anyone wants to do is collaborate with hidden and actually make it an actual product and sell it for actual prices like i can't imagine it but yeah i guess in other sense it could be a good thing because it could introduce a whole bunch of kids who don't really know of um you know the whole reconstructed trend because there's plenty of kids who have probably been born or been who've kind of got an interest in streetwear or in fashion from the the years of 2016 to now so maybe this is the time to maybe reintroduce it back to them again but for me eh -eh, big eh -eh for me big big eh -eh. i'm not vibing with that whatsoever mate you can absolutely throw that right in the bin for me next on the list of things to talk about let's talk about these actually have you guys seen the billy eilish nike air force ones i think they're banging I really do think they're banging. I might be in the minority here. And I think of maybe some cooler sneaker collectors out there might be like, no, nah, they're not the best ones. They're pretty shit. I'm waiting for another Kif pair. But in terms of a collaboration on an already existing model, especially a model that doesn't get used as often as it should do, the Nike Air Force One High, the lows get used a lot, the mids get used a lot, but you don't really see many people collaborating with the highs. It's an absolutely interesting way to kind of interpret it in your own way. The only thing that I'm a little bit kind of pissed off about or a little bit disappointed in is the fact that i feel like they pussied out a little bit so it's an air force one high in a sort of mushroomy type creamy colorway and it's sort of like a suede new bucky type of upper it looks like and on the laces it's got five individual velcro straps but the thing that kind of let me down about them you know it's great because it's all tonal so they're completely whatever color that mushroom color is on the entire thing for the midsole to the stitching to the laces all one thing i love that in what i want especially with lighter tones i feel like it looks really good especially with a big chunky sole it helps to make it look chunky but also a little bit slim at the same time I don't know how to explain it. it's really odd but whenever you see like a really chunky silhouette of a shoe even like a triple s the blend like a triple s you see those in like a in like a gray in like a desert sand in like an off-white it looks a little it just softens the lines it helps it to look a little bit less chunky but still chunky same effect happens to these billy eilish air force ones the only thing i'm disappointed in is the fact that they applied the velcro shots on the top which is an interesting twist but they then chickened out by having laces underneath i didn't know that was a fact because i think if i'm not too if i'm not mistaken these are the same pairs that hiroshi fujiwara kind of leaked quote unquote wearing on his instagram page a few months ago maybe a couple of years ago even maybe this might be the same pair and i actually thought at the time they were a fragment design which would make sense because hiroshi's done a few velcro design type shoes i think on a pair of court tennises or something i forgot which ones but he's done a few velcro design shoes from back in the day but if it, if it was me and i was being really picky i would say personally i would have much prefer them to have done maybe three thicker straps or just do the straps without the laces and maybe have the under have the the lace bit be similar to like you remember the a cold war air force ones where i saw like he, he got rid of the eyelets and the, if i'm not mistaken the tongue was basically i won't say glued in but it was sort of like seamlessly put into the the side panels of the lace stage you know what i mean that, that, that kind of style that would have made more sense that would have made it a little bit more um interesting to look at as a proposition and then the other thing that i'm not really too sold on is the finish on the inside with the straps and the loops and the fastenings i think it just 
it it just kind of throws it off a little bit. There's too even though it's tonal, all these lines clash. The lines on the toe box here, the line around the fastening, the stitching, the fastening sort of like plastic clip, the strap itself, they all clash. There's too many lines and angles here clashing at the same time. I think what would have been better is if this would have maybe been a bit invisible. Maybe it kind of um, disappears into the upper maybe you make the entire upper or you the this side of the shoe if that's possible maybe you make that seamless so that it kind of blends into one so that you could have these things protruding because there's too many protrudes like look there's that bit there's this mudguard bit there's a swoosh and then there's this bit there's like one two three four five six seven different kind of panels all going at one time and also for the inside too, I'd imagine when you're wearing them, they probably won't look the best in it with those kind of loops bumping all over on the inside. I don't know, maybe it's just me because they could have easily just put the strap on the inside here on the lace stain, have it, actually have it just strap over the laces instead of having it go so far across. Maybe, I'm not too sure. But again, in terms of a proposition, I'm a real fan of them because again, it's an Air Force One high, you know, it's basically mundane and basic as it comes but it's being given a bit of an interesting twist and i'm really a big fan of them i really really do like them and i'm really hopeful that these come out in men's sides and aren't just limited to women's if billy was being smart and i'm sure she's got a great team around her if you do want to make these like if you want to have your collaborations be um a sort of a lightning rod to get more girls into sneakers or to encourage more female collaborations with sneaker brands or whatnot you would probably make these women's only right sizing so you so that girls could actually purchase them in their size instead of having them done in men's and then having a smaller size be free and then some girls still can't purchase them because they're small i mean that's you know what i mean that might be a good way to go about things and also you could also if you wanted to billy she could have the air force one high this model be an actual women's model so maybe it's a bit slimmer in terms of a silhouette than the classic air force one because it's meant to accommodate a, 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 a this kind of general girl shape of foot more so than the unisex model that we see that's a bit wide or whatnot but i really like them i'm not gonna lie i think they're really really hard i'm not going to lie um it says yeah the be eilish air force one high is coming out april 25th it's priced 170 dollars available on sneakers uh, after a month, so sir, Billy has previously worked with Nike on two sneakers we looked before, an Air Jordan 1 KO and Air 50, Jordan 15. She's got a very eclectic and somewhat random taste in training, isn't it? There's nothing linking an Air Force One high with an Air Jordan KO or an Air Jordan 15. Like, it's a bit chaotic, isn't it, taste level wise? But uh, again, I mess with her because I've, I like the shoes. Um, in success, all immediately, there's a, pic, there's a video of her use, um, ad. I'm not going to play it, probably have copyrighted music. Uh, coming here for Swan, yeah, again, I said mushroom, so definitely mushroomy type of color. The lace tag with the Billy Eilish blush stick figure character on the top of it, it says here on the text. It's crafted with sustainability in mind. Um, Eilish's Air Force Ones feature environmentally friendly materials, starting down below with its Nike grind midsole of old Nike manufacturing scraps. That's funny, isn't it? I'm, I'm sure there's other sustainability involved in it, but sustainability is such a bit of a, such a joke and such a um virtue signaling thing to say so essentially the entire shoe is made up of you know toxic shit that's going to end up in some skip somewhere strangling a turtle somewhere in an ocean but the midsoles are environmentally friendly oh that's nice to hear so what when you're done with these what are you meant to do you meant to cut off the midsole and then chuck those into your recycling bin and chuck that into your normal bin the upper like come on man absolute joke sustainability you just say it as a buzzword or to maybe get tax right off so it doesn't really mean jack shit but anyway it continues blah 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 if we know anything about yeah 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 cool but yes yeah, um 25th of april due to come out soon i'm a big fan of them i think they look cool i think they look interesting hopefully they come out in the men's if not i have to stick my gigantic francis ngano type foot into a size nine and a half uk which is a women's 13 i think that would be a bit of a mad one but hopefully they come out in men's as well but if they don't i totally get it because girls do deserve some good sneakers too And another thing, my hair is looking mad, isn't it? I can't wait to get it done. I need to get it braided ASAP, but the top of my hair is looking absolutely mad. It's either I wear a hat nowadays or I just try and comb it out and look like an absolute madman, isn't it? But the hair at the moment is not hairy. It's like mad bits and stuff sticking all over the place. Like, ay, ay, ay. That's why I love the braids, man. It helps just to kind of have your hair a little bit neater. It helps me not look like a madman. I can wear hats normally. My headphones, I have to go right to the end in terms of the, you know, look at, look at, look at where it is. 
when I get my hair braided, it'll be all the way up here and you will see the actual other bit of the plastic. But I have to put it all the way down to the end. My hats, I have to put them all the way to the end flipping strap thing. It's always embarrassing. The back of my hat is like right at the end. I've, I've only got one of the clips on. Like I've got dreads. Well, I don't have dreads. I just have a big head and massive hair. <laughs> if I had dreadlocks, that'd be far better, right? I had these chunky, massive dreadlocks just hanging all over my shoulders. But then my hat was like hanging off a bit like 2 chain style. Cool. But I don't have that. I just have a huge succumb. I have like a Harry Maguire head and also the hair on top. Absolute madness, man. Absolute scenes. Absolute scenes when I get ready in the morning. Absolute scenes. Next on the list, you bumba clarts. We've got this. GH Bass New Season, courtesy of Streetwear Night Live. Now, I've got a pair of GH Bass loafers that i purchased from ebay secondhand tassel loafers worn twice and i absolutely wore them to the ground when i used to go to work in the morning you know back you know pre-pandemic time 2019 we used to commute to work i used to love them because they would go with literally any outfit you could wear a pair of shorts you could wear um, some denim you could wear some trousers um you could wear some track pants whatever you wanted always go with these penny loafers that sort of style especially the tassel one that i had i thought they looked so good um and also you know like a but the only thing i didn't like about them that's what i remembered was that because i have really wide feet towards the front the back of my foot's pretty decent in terms of narrowness but the front of my foot's quite wide but i am a true uk 10 the issue with um most shoes for me is that i think one of my foot's obviously is bigger than the other but it's probably a 10 to a 10 1.0 or a 10 2.0 so just a slight bigger than the other one but a 10.5 sometimes will be too big so my heel will end up slipping. It happens a lot with Adidas, right? Sometimes the 10 is too bang on, but then the 10.5, my heel slips. But then with these penny loafers, I had the same issue, but then also you have the issue of like your toes just swimming around in the front too much. So I had to go for the 10. And then of course the 10, the, my pinky toe will be rubbing against the side. It wasn't bunions or anything. It's just I've got barely big feet. Um, especially on the left hand side but then after a while when you once you wear them in they start to stretch and give a little bit so now mine's are like they're like actual slippers i could wear them all day break dance and whatnot fight and they're pretty decent so i'm a big fan of them but i've just got i've got reminded of these because i haven't worn mine because again like i don't go to work anymore and i only wore them as like kind of cool work shoes because they were the only shoe i had in my collection apart from wallabies or clark's desert boots and stuff which are a bit played out especially in the places that i go out i'm not gonna go out in shoreditch and be another person wearing flipping wallabies you can count me out of that one um so i kind of keep mine on ice until they get uncool again and then i'd wear them again or people forget about them but if ever i wanted to go out after work or something for a drink or hang out or go clubbing i would also like to wear them because you can wear them to a techno club and you can wear them to go work especially if you've got the correct outfit on quote unquote it kind of is a, it's a bit of a versatile shoe in that way so that's something that i always kind of use as a go-to shoe to go to work so i don't have to carry two pairs of shoes especially if i was cycling or something i mean last thing you want is to be cycling with a pair of penny loafers and be carrying a bag with a different set of shoes and they're going to change into when you go out um on a payday night or something i didn't want that so they'd definitely be my kind of go-to shoe and i'm actually surprised considering everyone's kind of you know sucking off these um what are these brands like padmore and barnes and whatever else brands that people are wearing at the moment in terms of that kind of you know older kind of dad swag i'm surprised the loafers haven't taken off as much as they have as much as they should have because it feels like to me whenever i see someone wearing them they look like the kind of person that got given them for free they don't look like a person who's purchased them or bought them with their own hard-earned money so i wonder if if that's a thing because i know it happened a lot with new balance when new balance was starting to get cool again they could only really sell their shoes to sneakerheads and sneakerheads again there's not back then there weren't many of us around the world so there's only a finite amount of people you could sell your shoes to but when you really which the, the, the time at which you really kind of reach popularity is when you kind of cross over and you reach critical masses when you kind of appeal to the normie the general public the kind of person that rocks into an office or an offspring or a size and says oh i like those new balances and purchased them that's when you really kind of made it and i feel like new balance did that really well maybe gh bass needs to kind of figure out a way to do that as well to kind of get out of appealing to people like me who are in the know and start appealing to the general public because i feel like these could go places man i feel like um they definitely have the range and the scope for them or maybe because the general public don't care for them because they they just put the gucci penny loafer up on the pedestal because that used to be a big thing in, in school for me back in the day the big shoe to wear the one that kind of shoe you had money or you were doing good things in life as well you had the prada sport 
or if you had a pair of the Gucci loafers. Those are two of the biggest kind of brand or luxury shoes you could wear back then. Um, so maybe that's the thing. Who knows? Anyway, but anyway, um, street, Streetwear Nightlife um, shared four pictures of some up and coming models and colorways. Um, I like this sort of gradient, sort of like tip sort of colorway thing they got going on here it's not really a gradient it doesn't really show too much on the blue it just looks like the the toe has been dipped into a bit of lighter blue paint towards the front and then it kind of gets darker towards the back i think i would have preferred to have seen a kind of you know margellas with the army sneakers with the paint splatter i think that would have worked far better on this sort of colorway this sort of like navy dark blue sort of color with the paint splatters on the front would have looked pretty decent so that might be an option to go forward um as a shoe then the next colorway here, you've got a sort of burgundy color in a slip-on uh, mule sandal type shoe. It kind of reminds me of the slip-on Gucci loafer that people were wearing, especially around my area. All the international Asian students, I don't know if they're all from China or from other parts of Asia, but they were absolutely in love with that Gucci loafer, man, with the, the furry one. They were all over the place with that. And then there was another shoe also, I forgot what brand it was. It might have been Luebe, I don't know which one it was, but they did a loafer that had a collapsible heel that was really popular a few years ago. People wearing that all over the place. Every time you walk around the street, you hear people with their heels slapping against their flipping foot, like they're getting flipping, you know, doggy or whatnot. You know what I mean? When they're walking, you always see that happening. Um, this style of shoe too, classic loafer with just the heel cut out. It looks like they've kind of up, they've kind of raised the toe box a little bit and allowed there to be more room on this little side panel, which might help me because this is where usually my toe sort of rubs against the outside. So that looks pretty decent. And they've been, and they've also added a bit of comfortability on the insole with these sort of like padded insoles here on the inside because obviously it's a, it's a little sandal type shoe. So that's interesting in that regard. So it's definitely, a, 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 it's definitely not just cut the heel off. They definitely tweaked it a little bit in terms of design to kind of get it right. So it fits right and it looks right in terms of it being a sort of slip on sandal. Um, I love the yellow with the sort of gradient. The gradient shows up much better in the yellow than it did in the navy. Um, again, I think a yellow loafer in that sort of tone is always going to stand out because it's very rare you find these in shops unless they're sold at like a H&M or like a top shop back in the day if they were like trendy and in season that time. But the fact that they're yellow in the first place, they look just fucking sick. I'm a big fan of them, not going to lie. So they look absolutely amazing. Then you also have these ones, which might be the weakest of the pair, I think. Because I feel like if your feet are bussing or if you're the kind of person that raw dogs loafers and doesn't wear socks, like an absolute heathen, then you're going to love these. But also, why are you not wearing socks with your shoes? You can wear those kind of invisible socks now where they just go around your toe and on the back of your heel so no one will see your shoe unless you're wearing shoes that have everything open and again why would you wear socks and stuff like that but if you're just wearing a classic loafer you should really have those invisible socks on especially if you're going to be walking around in these every day if anything you know what these are like i'm thinking about it now these are like the male birkenstock in it you know that like those mums in like southern america who wear birkenstocks and they pound them into the ground and then they try and resell them on Facebook and say they've only been lightly worn. And you can see uh, the whole imprint of this Karen's foot on the inside of the Boston. That's what these look like if you raw dog them. Raw dogging loafers looks like you're, uh, you know, uh, the male Karen. What is that? A Darren, Ken, whatever it may be. Um, I don't really like them. They've got like, these little, so they're all white upper and they have these little cutouts that look like flowers. Maybe it's similar to like a, is it like an espadrille or like something? I don't know what it is, inspiration from, but it's like a some sort of sandal. But I'm not really a fan of them whatsoever. I don't really like them too tough. And also, I don't like the fact that it's just, it's done kind of without committing to it. Why not do it all around the front? Why not do it all around this collar bit? Why is it disappearing on the underneath that? You know I mean, why not do it on the front of here? It just, it just feels like a an, an add-on on the top of it for no real apparent reason. So maybe they need a collaboration. Maybe that's what they need. They need a collaboration with a brand to kind of get them back into the zeitgeist and awaken them a little bit. But I, I, I think they're a bit boring, those ones. But the rest of them I'm pretty um, up for and down for in terms of wearing. Yellow, obviously, because the colorway is fucking banging. The gray that I don't really care about. The mule sandal thing, I think it's a cool, interesting twist. Maybe a bit late in terms of what's going on on the streets, but, you know, why not? And then this navy colorway also is a bit boring, I feel like, and the gray that doesn't really work on this application. But again, I feel like it's an interesting proposition regardless. But as a model, I hope these get more popular. I think they're interesting. Um, they're fairly inexpensive especially retail and they're also even more you know inexpensive if you buy them secondhand off of ebay because plenty of people purchase shoes like this for weddings and shit wear them once and don't want to wear them again so if you actually want to purchase a pair then definitely try them out because i feel like they're definitely something that could be 
is be essential part of your wardrobe, especially if you're somebody that maybe doesn't want to wear, you know, uh, derbies and whatnot. These are a good kind of alternative in between to wear if you want to kind of just spruce up and sharpen up your outfit and you don't want to wear wallabies or you don't want to wear Clarks and look like some kid who's got a design studio in Shoulders or something. Do you know what I mean? These are definitely the ones that you should check out. I'm definitely a big fan of the GH Bass. Weejans! Weejans or Weejans? Weejans, Weejans. Wherever you pronounce it, you know what I mean. Anyway, that's the show episode what 570 i think thanks again for tuning in the tune of the day today at the end of this show will be a song that i'm just about to pick now because i didn't plan this ahead of time so please forgive me but you know what the deal is you know how the situation lies and you know how we go the tune of the day today is going to be a track by ivory no a track by omar apollo from the album ivory featuring daniel caesar called invincible it's from his new album it's track five check it out it's a great album i've been listening to it all day today in the gym so that's going to be the tune of the day today for the audio listeners if you're listening via the watching via sorry the video podcast i'm sorry nothing for you the best you can do for me is leave me a review on apple or on spotify that'd be much appreciated or maybe leave me a comment or thumbs up or whatnot you know whatever you want to do in the description do it i would be much appreciated but until then see you guys again very soon Thank you for checking me out. It's been a pleasure. And this is Omar Apollo. The track is Invisible featuring Daniel Caesar. See you again very soon.